If I drop two objects with the same mass from the same height, they'll have the same gravitational potential energy and therefore the same kinetic energy on impact with the floor. But depending on what materials they're made up of, you'll get very different rebound heights. The red ball here is far less elastic than the blue ball, and so it doesn't bounce anywhere near as high, meaning it's lost more kinetic energy on impact than the blue ball has. And this is a great example of our two main types of collision, elastic, like the blue ball, and inelastic, like the red. Now an elastic collision is where both momentum and kinetic energy is conserved. That is, that Ke initial is the same as Ke final, the sum of the kinetic energies of the objects. And remember, of course, that energy is scalar. That means that even if an object's moving with negative velocity, its kinetic energy is still positive. We don't get negative energies. So let's look at an elastic collision in action. Here I have two masses, and looking at the information boxes at the bottom here, I'm going to take out their masses and their starting velocities. From this, I can work out what the momentum and the kinetic energy before the collision was. When I plug my numbers in, I get a momentum before in total of minus 0.5 kilogram meters per second. So that's momentum of number one plus momentum of number two. But because the velocity is negative, I end up subtracting the momentum of number two from number one. I then look at the kinetic energies using a half mv squared for both objects and remembering to turn the minus one into a plus one because of course energy is scalar I get an energy of 1.75 joules. So that's my before scenario, what about my after scenario? Well when the balls come together they impact, bounce off and head in opposite directions. And we can see here that now the velocity of ball 1 is minus 2.5 and the velocity of ball 2 is plus 0.5. So looking at momentum afterwards, momentum of ball 1 plus momentum of ball 2 comes together at 0.5 but negative kilogram meters per second. Yes, that is the same as our momentum before was. What about the kinetic energies? Well, again, using a half mv squared and putting our new velocities in, and once again, remembering that this minus 2.5 becomes a plus, I end up getting the same kinetic energy as before. That means that this is an elastic collision. However, most collisions are not elastic. For instance, if a car goes into the back of a lorry it's designed so that the crumple zones will give in dissipating energy and you'll see the lorry hardly moved. While momentum might have been conserved, kinetic energy definitely wasn't. There are two types of inelastic collision. The first that we're going to look at is called a totally or perfectly inelastic collision. And this is where two objects collide and stick together. Now, looking at the data at the bottom of this uh, box here on the left, I can take out my starting parameters, noting, of course, that because this one is traveling in this direction, it has negative velocity. Now, to figure out whether my collision is elastic or inelastic, I need to compare both the momentum and the kinetic energies before and after. So, looking at momentum before, when I plug my numbers in, I get an overall momentum of 6 kilogram meters per second. Once they have come together, they've stuck together, they start moving off in a positive velocity direction, I can use their new velocity of 2 meters per second and their combined mass, because they've stuck together, I can model them as a single particle. So the momentum just becomes the mass of 1 and 2 times the velocity that they both move off with, 
which is also 6 kilogram meters per second. Momentum has indeed been conserved. Now I need to model the kinetic energy, so again, simply sticking in my numbers for before, but remembering that this time my 2 is not negative. I get 18 joules beforehand. Kinetic energy after they've stuck together. I'll run the animation anyway, but we have the figures here. Using my velocity of 2, I get an overall kinetic energy of 6 joules. That's 12 joules difference. Kinetic energy after is definitely not kinetic energy before, therefore this is an inelastic collision. And because they stuck together, it's a perfectly inelastic collision. So this is the definition of a perfectly inelastic collision that you need to learn. And now we're going to look at the second type of collision, which is a partially inelastic collision. This is where the two particles don't stick together, but there is still a loss of kinetic energy. So again, there are our starting parameters. Let's work out the momentum beforehand by plugging in our numbers. We get 6 kilogram meters per second. Momentum after, if we have a quick look at the video. The two particles come together. They collide, but they don't stick together. They both end up moving in the direction that one was originally traveling in. Using our new velocities down here, I get my second momentum as being 6 kilogram meters per second. So they match, but what about our kinetic energies? Well, plugging in our initial values and remembering that, again, the 2 is not negative for energy calculations, I get my kinetic energy of 18 joules. But let's see what happens to their energy after they've collided. Plugging those numbers in, we get a kinetic energy of 8.882 joules. So it hasn't lost as much kinetic energy as the perfectly inelastic collision did, but it has still lost kinetic energy, therefore is an inelastic collision. And finally, let's have a look at a worked example. We have M1 of our railway wagon, we have U1. They collide together. Initially it's stationary, so U2 is zero. And we have M2. We are told they separate after the collision, so it's not gonna be a perfectly inelastic collision. And we're given V1 of our 8,000 kilogram wagon and we're told it is without change in its direction after the collision. So it's continuing in the direction that it initially impacted with. We're trying to find the velocity of the smaller 5,000 kilogram wagon. So first of all, we need to use conservation of momentum to work out what that velocity will be. We know that momentum before is just going to be the momentum of our 8,000 kilogram because there is zero momentum from the smaller one. Momentum after, they're both moving, so we have to think about both momentums. And rearranging our standard momentum equation to get it in terms of V2, we can then plug our numbers into the equation to get a velocity of the smaller wagon of 3.2 meters per second. Now they want us to find out the loss in kinetic energy. Well, we know that kinetic energy before was just the kinetic energy of the wagon. And that, when we plug our numbers in, is 3,600 joules. The kinetic energy after of the 8,000 kilogram wagon, remember these are moving off separately, so we have to work out them individually, works out at 4,000 joules when we plug our numbers in. And because we worked out the velocity in the previous question, we can plug in our numbers for the smaller wagon, add them together, and subtract them from our initial 
kinetic energy. And that gives us a change in kinetic energy of 6,400 joules. That's the way you always approach these questions. What's the kinetic energy before? What's the kinetic energy after? Compare them and rearrange. One final thing to look at is an interesting case when both objects have the same mass. Now, this is a very, very long-winded mathematical derivation to do in a revision video. So I'm just going to show you the overall outcome, which is that you get a total transference of momentum. It is an elastic collision. u1, the velocity of the first particle, is the final velocity of the second particle. Total transfer of momentum, speeds are the same, but afterwards v1 is zero, whereas u1 had initially been zero.